coming up on UGTV. A special session of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. I'd ask the clerk to announce the meeting and call roll. A special session is being held on Thursday, July 12th, 2018 at 5 o'clock p.m. regarding the administrator's budget presentation. Roll call. Kane? Barkley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbert? Here. Bynum? Here. Burles? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. 
Mugia? Here. Johnson? Here. Alvey? Here. Thank you. So uh, this meeting this evening is the presentation of the administrator's budget. And uh, of course, this is just uh, the beginning step uh, in the long public process of the budget. And so uh, there's quite a bit of material. And um, I'd ask commissioners, if you have some clarification questions, you know, feel free to ask those. Uh, but if you're looking for a specific topic that uh, would uh, warrant uh, more uh, time spent in a workshop, I would ask that you would please just uh, forward that request for a particular topic, uh, a presentation, and just the, the reasons that you're asking for that uh, particular presentation, and we will try to accommodate that on the uh, schedule moving forward. And so um, I will work with uh, uh, Administrator Bach to accommodate those requests. So having said that, I'd like to turn it over to County Administrator Doug Bach. Thank you, Mayor, Commission, citizens. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and present the uh, proposed 2019 budget. Uh, this is a budget that is accumulation of obviously all the uh, input we've had from the public and the commission as we worked through your strategic goals and had your input over the over the course of the last year and when we work on it seems like year round anymore to to put together where we are in the budget. Um, to start off, I just want to talk a little bit about community trends and where we're at. Uh, as we look at things that are positive throughout the community, we have property values are increasing. We're seeing our housing starts continue to go up. Our population increase this past year as it has each year in this decade. Our school districts are expanding. Um, we're seeing some new job creation through some major employers. Um, other commercial development coming in play. KU Hospital is expanding out through their campus area and also with their new KU Strawberry Hill site downtown. Um, we're seeing our community get recognized as that of, for soccer, with Major League Soccer and that in the U.S. be the soccer capital with Kansas City. Um, I also put Leavenworth Road on this as a major piece of infrastructure in our community that our residents can cherish and think a lot of as we move into the second phase of that this year moving forward with our Northeast Master Plan, which is starting to move into the later phases of finalizing where we're at with that. And we're building fiber infrastructure throughout our community from our budget initiative last year that takes us east to west and north to south in the community. So we take the commission goals and we wave them into where we're at. So that allows us to do strategic goals for our future prosperity of our community. Um, and the focus of this budget really stays with that as we are very neighborhood focused in what we're doing. Our mowing budget is very big within this. It's one that we started several years ago and we continue to budget that at the higher level, at level we're at, not just for unified government facilities, but also for vacant lots and such in the community that we're taking care of. Um, securing of vacant structures is actually an area where we're adding money to it. That way we keep the structures from falling apart or going into deterioration mode before we can get into the hands of a rehabber to help this building along and then bring it back as a value in our community. Demolition, large number that we built into our budget last year, adding some money into our debt to do that both in this year and in next year continues to be built into this budget. Um, rehabbing uh, vacant structures on properties our Park Drive Neighborhood Revitalization, our NRSA project, where we just completed a couple of those neighborhood walks earlier this week. And we'll have a picnic with the community this weekend. It's all about changing a tipping point neighborhood and making it work so it's one that it doesn't go in a, the wrong direction, but we're able to keep this neighborhood and keep it moving in the right direction. Um, our Strawberry Hill initiative that the mayor laid out in his state of the government finds its way of building into this as part of the neighborhood revitalization of what we can do in an area where we're seeing people come in and wanting to invest in this neighborhood, but what we can do as government to go in and help stimulate that and help that grow and work even better within the rest of the community. We have a Choice Neighborhood Grant, which literally has the opportunity to leverage a couple of million dollars to come in from the federal program into our community 
And then with this whole neighborhood focus, this is the Strong Downs Initiative, which really is a, a tool that is a national program that's out there and how you can look at it increasing the values overall of what your community has, what you can put back into that community and look at it and say, okay, we've changed the value in this area and look what an impact it has overall and, and doing that from the neighborhood level. I've also mentioned just a couple of economic development projects and we have a lot of different things going on, but most notably that which we just announced earlier this week with the Merck, develop, Merck Grocery coming into the downtown and we'll be bringing forward a development agreement to the Commission in August on that one. Um, Turner Diagonal Project, where we were able to go and do development south of I-70 along this. On the north side, we have the opportunity to do residential, commercial, and industrial development. Um, part of this is tied to infrastructure improvements we need to make and grants we've been seeking, but we're also looking for other al al alternatives to get this project started on an earlier note. And then our American Royal Project, to which this group has continued to move forward to raise funds to do what will be a major destination attraction in our community. And with this, we also have our investment in public safety and neighborhood infrastructure, which are always important investments for our community. Though I will say, this budget is predicated on the 3.8 cents sales tax, which we're seeking renewal of this year. It expires in 2020, in, July, in June of 2020. And it brings in a little over $10 million annually for the operation of these areas. Um, by doing this, it has lowered our reliance on property tax where we're able to take this money from the sales tax. It's also a sales tax that we get a large portion paid from people that don't live in Wyandotte County. When they come here and they visit the Village West area, they pay their dollars in from other communities. We capture that through this dedicated sales tax and take it back into our operations. So with that, I have the 2019 proposed budget, and it's one that I believe positions our community to realize the opportunities that are there for us. It's fiscally sustainable for the future, and by that I mean we build in a lot of one-time cost type things, or the capital costs are in there, but this is not one that grows the overall size of our budget, or grows the size of our government. We're not looking to add a lot of employees to this, so it, when we look at our year-to-year -year expenditures, there are things that I think we can continue to control because it really pushes where we are from a revenue to expenditure side of the equation. But it's one that it keeps us in a point that I'm not adding additional, a lot of additional employees to our budget so we can stay within the framework in future years, uh, depending on our future revenues. And then it also keeps us competitive for growth in the future. So with this, propose a, to reduce the property taxes for the third straight year and this is on the, the city side of the mill rate. It aligns with the Commission's strategic plan, and it lowers our reliance on debt and lease finance projects. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Kathleen Von Achen, our Chief Financial Officer, and she's going to walk through some of the, the numbers and where the, the money is planned out. And then following that, we'll go into the detail of the different areas that we're looking to spend money. Kathleen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner and County Administrators. We want to go to the next slide, which is the overview of the all total expenditures of all funds. Oh, thanks. Um, all right, so the total proposed budget for 2019 is uh, $376.4 million. And uh, what you see here is a combined pie chart of 29 different uh, funds that we budget each year um, with the city general fund and the county general fund and consolidated parks general fund which is are the three general fund uh, funds uh, it being the largest component of the entire budget and followed by the special revenue funds, which have 18 different small funds we keep track of, and then Enterprise that has six different other funds. Now, I did want to point out also that most of these percentages you see on this pie chart have not changed from the 2018 level. So, so going to the, the general fund, so the city general fund is the largest operating account, and 
It's $160 million that we're proposing. The uh, public safety pie chart is the largest at 57%, $92 million totaled there. That's for the police and fire departments. Um, last year, this percentage was 55, so it's gone up to 57% of the total city general fund. Uh, the next largest slide, or slice of the pie, is the uh, community services, which includes transit and neighborhood resource center, economic development, and urban planning, among other areas. Um, that is, totals $21 million, and they have the same percentage as last year, so no changes there. And then the third largest is the Public Works Department, totaling $19 million. Now, general administration, just so you, to point out, that includes the clerk, uh, city clerk, the UG clerk, the chief knowledge officer, the county administrator's office, finance, legal, HR, and purchasing, a variety of areas. The next slide is the county general fund. And again, public safety is the largest at 55%. That's the same percentage as uh, we have in 2018. $35 million there uh, supports police dispatch, sheriff, including the jail operations, and emergency management. Uh, the next largest slide is general government or administration, and that is where a number of our uh, county functions that are mandated by the state take place. Uh, legislative auditor, the county appraiser, county clerk, the GIS and uh, 311, uh, the treasury, property tax administration, motor vehicle registration, as well as some allocation of the rest of the administrative type functions. So. Um, a whole variety of things going on there. That's $12.8 million. And then um, the, the third largest is the judicial services area, $8 million. That includes the operating side of the district court and the district attorney's office uh, for one. So um, the other funds are include, you can change it now. Uh, debt service, 48%, that's the same percentage as we have currently in our current budget. That's the city and county bonded interest fund, uh, totaling $40 million a year. That is the portion that we pay out in debt service, uh, in debt service payments. Um, the special revenue funds are 18 different funds, totaling $37 million. Those include generally the county levy funds and special revenue funds. And then uh, the last slot, pie chart slide is the, is the, are the enterprise funds. Uh, there are six of them. Uh, the sewer system is the largest at 49 million. And uh, their percentage is currently 70%. It's now increasing 73 due to greater investment in capital, uh, cash funded capital. And there's also the other um, emergency medical services at $11 million, which funds our ambulance and medical response. Um, that it is partially funded uh, with the sales tax. But generally, all of these enterprises are business, uh, think of them as businesses supported by charges for services uh, and run very independently from um, and, and are not usually reliant on property taxes or sales taxes. Uh, so medical services, a little bit of a different case, so based on how it was composed initially. Uh, moving on to the general fund. Now we're gonna provide here a table of um, how the proposed budget um, looks compared with our, for example, our current adopted 18 budget is the first column, followed by what we're proposing for the amended, and then the proposal for the 19 budget. Um, so in 2018, you'll notice there was a, a $3.5 million increase in our revenue estimates for the current year. And that's due to better sales tax performance and uh, motor vehicle registration taxes, as well as um, higher uh, under budgeted uh, uh, revenue estimates in other areas. And so that, and, and you have to keep in mind that this is where that two mil reduction was in effect um, that you all approved during the last budget process. 
So on the expenditure side, though, we have um, determined that there are needs for 2.3 million in increased expenses in uh, the current year. And so, of course, that 2.3 million is offset by those improved revenue estimates. So as a result, we ha uh, are estimating that we're going to be using fund balance or adding to the fund balance by seven or $677,000. On the 2019 side, though, uh, what we have is a very modest increase in revenues of $2 million. Um, part of that, um, mod or it, which is, uh, well, I don't have it with me. It's a, the percentage is rather low. We, we, uh, it's $2 million. We have, uh, we do include a variety of measures, such as the reduction in the mill rate. But uh, the property tax is doing well. And so we'll be talking about that later in the presentation. There's also correspondingly a $4 million reduction or increase in expenditures to pay for basic personnel costs. But uh, the increase we're proposing for 19 in the city general fund is a modest 2.9% increase. So, and finally, I want to point out that at the bottom, you'll see that we are um, achieving that 12% or, I'm sorry, the 17% um, reserve um, or two-month reserve target that um, we've discussed in various meetings, especially at the EDNF committee. So that's the 17% re represents two months of operating expenditures and um, it is recommended by GFOA. On the county side, we are anticipating increases in 18 for revenues of 1.5 million due to improved motor vehicle registration and register of deeds um, fees. Um, but we're also uh, uh, identifying 3.5 million in additional expenditures, mainly due to personnel costs in various um, county functions and a couple of one-time items we'll talk about later. So as a result, we um, are going to be dipping into the fund balance for um, 18 to the tune of $1.575 million. Um, but mo most of that is for one-time items, you understand. So in 19, we are projecting a very modest increase in, uh, in revenues of $2.2 million. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, this is uh, and a 1.1 million dollar increase in expenditures. The 1.1 million dollars in expenditures, uh, uh, much of it is for one-time items. So um, the, uh, we'll talk about that later in the presentation. So again, we're using fund balance of 594,000, and so we end up with an ending fund balance of 13 percent which is below the two-month operating reserve target. And, but um, we are um, utilizing those revenues or reserves um, to address unanticipated um, activities. And that's what a reserve is all about. In addition, we're also, um, many of those activities are one time. So we'll talk more about that later on. Um, now I'd like to introduce you uh, to Melissa Sieben, who will be talking with you about streets and other budget initiatives. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. So tonight, um, the three assistants will present um, the kind of a little more detail into different areas of the budget as we move forward. The, the parts of the strategic plan are identified in the kind of color code that we believe that these projects or um, different expenditures will address. So with streets we have, and all the rest of the subsequent slides, we've highlighted some things in yellow. They're kind of like the bigger, major initiatives that are in the budget. Um, and we will p uh, point out a few other things on the slides, but we don't intend to cover them in, in full detail. So the big um, um, items on here are all related to 2019 expenditures, so we're not bouncing back and forth 18, 19. This will be all 19 um, that we'll be presenting. So what you'll see is that we'll be um, completing the next phase of Leavenworth Road from 63rd to 78th in 2019. And we'll also be starting design and engineering on the 5th um, and 7th streets um, sections of Minnesota, those blocks um, which um, we're going to be needing for some of our increased activity, um, especially with our recent announcement of a grocery store downtown. 
And then, of course, we're going to be um, continuing our street maintenance program with a lot of those different um, options that we've been discussing to take those dollars as far as we can to help improve our surfaces, roadway surfaces in the community, and continuing our Safe Routes to Schools program. The next slide is um, soil related items that we um, have um, been working on over the last couple of years with you. And the two that are highlighted in yellow are actually new this year for 2019. This is additional funding for securing vacant structures. We do have a base amount in the budget, but this is to take us to that next level to help those vacant structures be less trouble to their neighbors and also um, secure those structures so that um, future um, individuals who might want to rehab them will have a structure that's not seen as much water infiltration or possible damage from people getting inside that don't belong in there. And the other item that you did uh, approve um, is the submittal of the Choice Neighborhoods Grant. And um, those dollars um, will help um, in the Northeast area if we do receive the grant to do some planning and development of a future phase of changes up there. The next slide that we have is our transit uh, slide, which um, shares some of the larger items we'll be um, purchasing or working on in 2019. Two transit vans and one cutaway bus. This last year we had five. This year, um, this coming year, we're looking at three, um, along with the regional fare collection system, which is the integration so you can get on at one spot, get off at another, get on again, and not have to have different method and means for um, uh, paying for those services, one card, one system. The next slide is a big one. It's our water pollution control. Um, as Kathleen was showing you in the enterprise system, it, we are doing more work in that area. Two of these yellow um, uh, bullets on here are actually huge projects. Um, the Cow Point Biosolids Project, which is a different way of handling the leftover waste stream from our wastewater treatment process that we're working to move on, which is um, somewhere north of $70 million project, as well as our um, Walcott Treatment Facility, um, which will go out um, near 435 and Walcott Drive. The other item that's in yellow at the top is um, our sewer rate anticipated increase of 5%, which is down from 7% this um, current year. So um, they are coming down slowly but surely. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Gordon Criswell, Assistant City Administrator to uh, County Administrator to also cover a few more areas. You want me to do this? Okay. Thank you, Melissa, for running the clicker. Good afternoon, Madam Commission. Uh, under the customer services, I'm going to highlight uh, my resource connection. This is a uh, joint initiative between Wyandotte and Johnson County for uh, data collection of uh, our service providers, uh, and it also includes our EMS services. We have uh, folk who cross the county lines to get services, so this will allow us to track who's getting services and where so we can cut down on duplication. The uh, police chief has introduced the uh, police athletic league. Uh, as you all know, we're renovating the old St. Mary's Church for this program. This is a, uh, an initiative to uh, provide uh, programming for young people in the summer and after schools. Uh, it's designed to be first a crime reduction initiative, but also it's designed to introduce uh, young people into careers in public services and hopefully uh, a career in law enforcement when they uh, get ready. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> As you all know, you have asked us to do a number of master plans over the years, and this is uh, uh, the next iteration of the uh, uh, Central Avenue Corridor Master Plan, and it will be similar to other master plan initiatives that uh, we've completed over the years. Next. Uh, under the uh, Police Department, uh, we are purchasing um, 30 vehicles this year, patrol uh, vehicles with cash in 18, and 30 uh, patrol vehicles in 19 through uh, lease financing. This allows the police department to keep up with their vehicle rotation schedule for our uh, replacement. The mandatory tasers is an initiative the chief has asked that we fund, uh, which allows for him to mandate all of his operational field units to carry uh, tasers. Tasers 
would be a less lethal uh, force, less lethal option for our officers in the field. And uh, the chief would like all of the officers to have that piece of equipment. Um, it will also mean that we need to add tasers to our equipment uh, capital rotation project, uh, process. The Johnson County Forensic Scientist contract is a position in their lab. It's a firearms analyst. Um, we send information or, uh, over to the Johnson County lab and we will get first priority on their ballistic testing so that we can speed up the, our department's uh, investigative process with uh, crimes. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> In the district attorney's office, you all have heard that he has reams and boxes of old files and cases in the uh, fourth, and fifth, fourth and fifth floor of the uh, county courthouse. This will allow him to start to digitize some of those files and get that space in a more uh, productive uh, uh, status in the future. We've moved up. Um, security uh, camera upgrades and replacements uh, just to provide for a better monitoring of our, of our buildings. Uh, the radio encryption project is a huge project. Um, all of our public safety radios have this software that's encrypted and it, that encryption will expire in uh, 2021. So we're starting now because we have to literally touch every one of our radios and they have to be uh, upgraded before October 2021 so that we don't have any interruptions in police communications. And we're starting that this year. Uh, next, I will turn it over to Joe Connor, my counterpart, and he's gonna talk about uh, public safety fire. Okay, well, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you, Gordon. So, uh, in, in the, in the fire, de fire department, oops, there we go. In the fire department for 2019, we're continuing to upgrade and replace a lot of their rolling stock. And I wanted to point your attention to uh, the, the two items at the bottom of this slide, which is two pumpers and one fire quint. That's the largest pieces of apparatus that they have. The last few years, we've, we've been doing two and three a year, which gets them back on a 10 year replacement cycle. And so if we continue this trend over the next few years, they're gonna see a lot better performance and a lot less maintenance cost out of these, out of these uh, running these units as much as they run them. The other item on this, this list is the beginning of an initiative that the fire, uh, our current fire chief and the fire departments across the country are starting to pay attention to. This includes laundry equipment, lockers, and bunker gear. And the, the, the reason for this is to uh, remove, when they're in a, in a, at a fire scene, they can remove the carcinogens and things that get on their bunker gear, have a second set of bunker gear to, to put back into the field for service. And so it will reduce their risk for uh, exposure to carcinogens. Um, again, this is the beginning of this effort. Um, they'll begin to, to start, uh, this will be a, a big part of our design process when we start to build new stations and also rehab existing ones to make rooms for this equipment so they can uh, have a safer environment to work in. Under innovation and technology, uh, one of our really big projects that's underway now and should be completed in 2019 is the replacement of the public health department's electronic medical records system. And uh, this is a, a very large system, which is the backbone for not only, you know, our health department, but a lot of health departments across the state of Kansas. And what we've done with this is uh, we've gone in and created a five county consortium under the leadership of our innovation and technology office and our CKO. And they spent the last year or so developing requirements and with, with the five counties and testing different products that are out there. And so now they're ready to, to uh, go out for bid and actually purchase the product to, for, to start to get the installation going. So we feel like through that five county effort, we will get a better price and we're gonna have a really good, a very well-tested product that a lot of people are gonna be looking at before we get it. So we feel pretty good about that process. Uh, the other one I wanted to highlight here is traffic video storage. So currently we have a relationship with the Board of Public Utilities that places cameras and fiber and, and, uh, and has the video capability for our, our, all of our traffic cameras that we have on our signals. Um, they would like to be out of the video business and we'd like to be in the video business. And so we have a lot of uh, immediate law enforcement needs for this and we feel like 
uh, that would help them. I know that Chief Ziegler has expressed an extreme interest in having access to this video when they're trying to solve uh, crimes that happen in neighborhoods. Uh, that was that would really help them out. Plus, we have, we have some needs from a traffic engineering and an event planning standpoint to have access to this video too. So we're gonna start that transition in 2019, what we're proposing in the budget. And then under parks and recreation, um, again, as I think if we talked about previously, the, the parks master plan has been completed, identified large amounts of capital and operating um, budget uh, you know, recommendations. These recommendations are not included in the budget for 2019, but we are including things that, that, we, that we have access to funds for whether it be general funds, grants, or philanthropic dollars. So just to highlight some of the uh, activities on this page, there'll be improvements to City Park in 2019. That's a result of community development block grant dollars that became available when the Park Drive neighborhood area was identified by HUD as a, as a redevelopment area. So City Park's in that district, and so we'll be able to take some of those, that HUD money and put it back into City Park. There'll also be a playground replacement and then also, uh, again, through a grant that was applied for and received, uh, we'll be putting in our first fitness court. This is, a, this is a trend that the parks and recreation departments across the country are seeing, and our parks director would like to place the very first fitness court in our community in 2019 with, with the grant dollars. That's it for me. Um, I'm gonna ask Doug to come back up and take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Joe. As you can see, as you go through this budget, our focus is on a lot of capital or projects as we go through. As I say to the beginning, we're not looking to grow our government. As Kathleen went through the financials on it, you could see where year end our revenues to our expenditures. It's not a position where I really like that to see that our expenditures are exceeding our revenues. However, based on the fact that we are doing a lot of capital and projects, I feel like we keep ourselves in a position that we can bring this back in the coming year if we find that we don't get our revenues up or we'd look at other ways where we want to find some efficiencies within where we are we are expending money one of those areas and that's why we talk about I talk about personnel and where we go away from that is this slide that's up here now um, as you can see we have I would say very modest increases these are not raises really these are just COLA increases that we're building in for 2019 for our employees we have two percent for most all our employees, with the only exception being for our sworn law enforcement, where we have them at 3%. Um, our health fund, we see that going up from 5 to 8% in the coming year. So we're, the, our share as the employer looks like it'll increase our cost by $1.3 million. And our workers' comp fund, we're likely to see that go up another million and a half. In fact, we're, we're quite certain that's where we'll be for 2019. And then retirement rate increases, and these are set out by the state, and they come down to us. So CAPERS is set at 0.4 tenths of a percent, and KPNF is at 2%. So these equal 1.8 million. So overall, this is an 8.8 .8 million dollar increase for 2019 for our operating budget across all our different funds. This is not a one-time expenditure, as you're all aware. Most all of these rates will go up again by this light comparison in the, in the coming year. So it's 8.8, .8, goes into 19, and then you layer on another $9 million for 20, um, like that. So it just kind of continues on from that perspective. Just talking about revenue trends, as we went through those a little bit in the beginning, that there are positive. However, they don't quite meet where the appraised value increases are, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit so our residents can understand where we're at. Our property taxes are up as we're seeing revenues of about 3%. Our sales tax and our enterprise funds are up 3 and 4% respectively. And then our uh, fees are up about a percent. So this is a nice modest increase, a good increase that we like to see, definitely better than anything that's going in the reverse direction that helps us continue to do the business we're doing. Why is the property tax set at uh, 3%? And that's because we look at it and say, okay, well, the assessed valuation is up an average of 7.9%. So we ought to be up at 8% mark. A few factors that come into that are delinquency rate. It sets at about 6.9%. So we have to back those dollars out of what we actually receive. We're also looking at a very large refund going back to Hollywood Casino. 
Unfortunately, the valuation of that casino has continued to decline since they've been in operations out there, despite the fact that I believe they're continuing to do very well for their revenue perspectives. Um, the Board of Tax Appeals has ruled that their value of their facility is worth far less than what we'd originally anticipated would be, and then even lower than what the value is that our appraiser puts on the books. So as we've gone through this um, at the state level, uh, they've determined that that's going to come back, and we think we'll probably be in a final ruling next year. And this will be for successive years. So this is about a $2.5 million impact on our community as a whole. Um, one of the entities that hit the largest by this is the Bonner Springs School District because it sets within their school district, and you think percentage of budgets, this is a big impact on them. Um, but for us, it's about a $1.2 million impact that we'll lose in 19, and then could be successive for years going forward. So not only is the income level being, will be lower for the current year, we'll be paying back for the previous years where we debated the um, actual valuation. And then of course the tax rate reduction that we're putting in for the two mills to be reduced, um, that takes away from our funding. So that takes our overall net revenue increase from what the average resident would pay on the same house of 7.9%, but our actual revenue that we get because of these other factors takes us down to about 3%. I wanted to show how this impact comes back on star bonds. There's always that question about where's all the star bond dollars going, and there's different ways when you have a $376 million budget or even a couple hundred million in the general funds where these go, um, how you would do this. But here to show, we started with the 12.4 million, um, by the six different mills that were taken out since that time, that's worth a little over 6.1 million. Uh, Fire and EMS shows up on here because one, we have the quarter cent that's dedicated toward EMS, and then we have the dedicated sales tax that goes toward fire, police, and our streets. So it hits that $1.5 million number, and then streets and neighborhoods, 1.4. And then we just kind of scattered out through different areas of operation. So overall, when we look at where our tax rate is to the community, this is the city and the county. So the green line is the county, and it's been a fairly static flat rate going across there, staying at that 38.8 um, mill rate. The city is the top one, and that's the 43.875, and then it drops by a couple mills each year down to what we're proposing to be the 38 mills. Um, one of the lowest marks, I believe, well, I know that is the lowest mark that the city has been in any recent history. Um, and combined, the same thing for both the rates coming together for what they'll be for a combined mill rate. One of, the, one of the big things I just note on this is of the 38 mills that's there for the city, about 16.9 mills from that goes toward our debt. And I know you all are very aware of how that impacts us, but when I break this out and say, okay, that leaves me with the balance that goes toward my operating fund, the six mills that have come out have actually been, a, accounts for about a 22% reduction in the city operating budget over these past three years. So that's something we want to continue to look at and think about because it's hitting a point where how much can you take from this one fund is probably not sustainable to keep to it and the focus has to be more toward the debt side and the county side as far as where we're looking at and where we're spending our money if if we're looking to continue to lower our mill rate in future years <clears throat> and i think that also kind of prompts the question and it's a question that our commission has asked us well where does this put us or what is our goal as we go forward from where we want our mill rate to be um, Currently, if you take the 25 first-class cities in the state of Kansas, and I say currently being where we at from where we established our mill rate last year, we're 13th. So we're right in the middle of the middle of the group as far as high and low. Number one would be the highest, which is where we were back in 1996 prior to consolidation. But now we're sitting at 13th. I don't know where the two additional mills will take us across the state until we see what the other jurisdictions do. And then when we look at counties, we're setting at 95th out of 105. So considering there's a number one being the highest, we're relatively low as a county as far as where our mill rate comes into play there. Though it's kind of an odd comparison when you look at the metro areas versus the rural areas and they have different reliances on the county factors. So that one's a little bit different by comparison. 
What's this mean to our taxpayers? So we ran this just to look at it so they could tell if you had the same home you were in and you received the average assessed valuation of 8.7%. So if you had a $100,000 home, you were paying $907 last year, that average valuation would mean your tax bill will go up to $986 on the city side. So if you're paying both city and county taxes, um, after our two mil reduction, that drops it down to 961. So you're still gonna see a variance of about $54 on that $100,000 home. If you were in just the county and you received that 8.6 average valuation is how that structures out in that part of our jurisdiction, then you would see about a $38 increase on your tax bill based on just valuation in changes. And of course that varies from house to house across the entire community, so we just can only work with averages here. When you look at the overall tax bill, I know as a county, everyone looks to us and says, we are the, we're the tax collector, we send out the tax bill, so there's the assumption that we're getting it all, but this, this graph or this dollar bill kind of delineates how that's out. We represent about 46% of the tax bill being the city and the county. So we're well less than half now. We've used uh, USD 500 as a comparison for school districts. It can vary a couple of percent based on which school district you're in, if you're in Turner, Piper, or Bonner Springs School District. But you can see how they kind of break out. The other ones will be the same, and it would just be the school district that would change a little bit by percentage based on whichever district you're in. But it's, it's fairly close within all of them. And with that, I'll just point out, and as I started this presentation, we started this process last November when we started looking at our capital projects and take those to our public works committee. We had our first public hearing in March to get citizen input as a direction we should go and areas we should think about. Um, we had a strategic planning session with the commission to kind of lay out our priorities, and I know I heard then loud and clear, tax rate reduction was a high priority along with a few other different items that we've tried to build into this. And then we've gone through our capital and maintenance programs in May to build those in. And what we've built in is fairly close to it. And we'll try to de delineate out any changes we might had for May, but I think they're fairly close to where they were. Um, this is our budget calendar for the month. Basically, we're looking at every Monday and Thursday until we get to the August 2nd, which, are which is our targeted time for approval of this budget. I'll also note in the fine print at the bottom is the uh, website we have. So if anyone has this, is pulling this up at home or whatever, you can click on this side. It'll take you directly to our budget book. Nice uh, 650 pages or so, so someone can take into full detail of what's going on. I believe you all have that link. You should have it sent to you earlier so you can uh, Spend your whole weekend going through and digging into the detail, but I will offer that if, if you don't have time to read through all the 600 plus pages, if you read through the budget message in the beginning, uh, we try to go through and kind of lay out a lot of the detail. Some of it's just a summary back of some of the things presented in this PowerPoint presentation, but there's a little bit more detail that goes into that to give you a summary feel of, of what's in the different part of the document, and then you, as you look through the rest of it from this point. And with that, Mayor, I would like to conclude, but I'd like to recognize the budget staff. So while myself and my assistants and Ms. Von Atchen give the presentation, I have uh, Debbie Johnson, our Deputy Finance Director um, here, and Reginald Lindsay and his staff. If you would all rise, please. I'd like to at least recognize this group and put in the long hours to make it come together. Thank you. Did you want to, any closing comments or I'll take it? Um, unless there are any questions, again, I just would like to uh, ask that if you have particular or specific uh, workshop topics that you'd like us to explore, please just send an email to me uh, with the rationale, what you're looking for, and we will uh, do our best to accommodate those. Okay, I just make one additional announcement or recognition. I'd like to recognize Chief Shirley, who's here with us tonight. Uh, Chief, you want to stand up? Just six months ago, over six months ago, when I contacted uh, Kevin and asked him if he could come in and help us out during a time when, uh, with Chief Jones' departure from our 
department. Um, needed somebody to step in with a lot of experience and wisdom. And he brought that to us. Very, a great deal of commitment to our community, great deal of loyalty and commitment to the fire department the whole time of what he's done. I really thank you very much for your time and the, the months you've been here. And today is his last day as the interim chief coming back. So he's going back to retirement. Um, Maybe you can get it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much to him. Thank you, Chief. I'll just let you all know that um, Jack Andrade will be serving as our acting chief while I complete my process until a chief is permanent chief is named. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our meeting this evening. We're adjourned until 7 p.m. and we'll be back here in the chambers. Thank you.